Support for this podcast comes from Canon. Canon knows when it comes to home printers, it needs to be love at first print. If you don't click immediately, you're in for a long-term relationship with serious trust issues. Canon have designed their wireless printers to be as easy to use as possible with chat support, step-by-step videos and wireless connectivity on most models to get you set up for printing in no time at all. Visit canon.com.au forward slash print to discover all the ways Canon supports you. Dun, dun, dun. Today is a very exciting day, whether you saw it on your podcast app or not. It is episode 100! 100. <laughs> Super exciting. I am just thrilled that we got here, Kirst. I know. Who and would have thunk? Who would have thunk it? <laughs> and it's not the end of the journey. Like, we're just firing up on all cylinders. I know, we're just getting started, baby. So if you've listened to all 100 episodes, snaps to you. <laughs> You're amazing. Kirst, I, I don't even think Amy's listened to all 100. I've listened oh, no, to all 100 has. at she least has. twice. <laughs> Some three times. <laughs> Kirst, it's a pleasure doing this podcast with you. Thank you, Jared, for everything that you do. Yes, and I am super excited because I've got, I am like super fangirling today. I'm so excited. We've got Brooke McCallery from Slow You Home podcast with us. We couldn't think of a better way to celebrate our 100th episode. We were coming, trying to come up with all these ideas and then we were just like, let's just get Brooke on. How cool would that be? It's perfect. And you'll notice we've recorded this little intro after we recorded with Brooke because we get to like the end of the podcast and then I remember that it's number 100. So we thought we've got to come back in and record this now for you. So enjoy and we look forward to many, many more podcasts together with you. Hey, it's Amy here, just popping in to let you know we had a little bit of trouble with our internet connection for this episode, so you may notice that the vocals drop in and out just a little bit, but I reckon you'll get used to it super quickly and enjoy the episode. Welcome to the Art of Decluttering podcast. We're your hosts. I'm Amy Ravel from Simply Organised. And I'm Kirsty Frugia from Feels Like Home. We can't wait to share with you all our tips and tricks to help you declutter and keep your home and family organised. To hang out with us more, check out The Art of Decluttering on Facebook and Instagram. And we'd love you to check out our website, outofdecluttering.com.au and see all that's happening over there. Let's, Let's get, get started. started. Amy? Kirsty. I have got one of my very, 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 very favourite, favourite fangirling moments ever (laughs) happening (laughs) right now. Right now, as we sit and speak, we are very excited that we've got the gorgeous Brooke McCallery with us and Kirst is just on cloud nine. I know, super fanning. (laughs) I am a super fan too, Brooke, just so you know. Listen, every time you release an episode, but Kirst is like a whole nother level of super fan. (laughs) Yep. Probably. <laughs> maybe even stalkerish. So maybe, Brooke, you might want to unfriend me on every platform going forward. <laughs> it's good to know, but I, I think we're good. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to do a little bio on Brooke to introduce you all to her because some of you may not be um, as aware of Brooke as my stalking abilities. Although yours should be because I talk about her all the time. Yes, she does. Yeah. So... After being diagnosed with severe postnatal depression in 2011, Brooke embarked on a one-woman mission to cut out the excess in her life and reconnect with what was really important. She learned about minimalism and simplicity, immersed herself in the slow living philosophy and discovered the beautiful benefits of living with less. Over two years, Brooke decluttered more than 25,000 items from her home and created a slow home and rediscovered her health, her passion, her energy and her spark. Since since coming to understand the huge benefits of living a slower, simpler life, it's become her mission to help others define and achieve what their slow living goals are. She's written at Slow Your Home for a long, long time (laughs) and has been hosting the Slow Home podcast since April 2015 in which time they've connected with millions and billions of people, (laughs) introducing them to the ideas behind slow living and helping them find space for slow, even on the busiest days. Welcome, Brooke. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's super, super lovely to have you with us. We said in your bio that you were diagnosed with postnatal depression and that was really a catalyst for your transformation. Can you tell us a bit about how you began your decluttering and did you have a vision for what you wanted your life to end up like? 
Uh, at the time, I didn't necessarily have, I, I, actually, I definitely didn't have a vision at the time. All, all I knew was that I was completely overwhelmed. So um, like taking a step back six months before I was diagnosed, you know, I, had, I was um, heavily pregnant with our second baby. Our, our first was only, you know, 18, well, 15 months older. Um, we were renovating. I was running my own jewelry label. My husband worked really long hours um, and life was very full on, very the opposite of slow and mindful. Uh, and once I was diagnosed with the postnatal depression, that was sort of the headspace I was still in. So this idea of having to stop and focus a little more on my own, um, my headspace and my mental health was so counter to the busyness and the, you know, success at all costs mentality that I've been carrying around. So when, uh, when I was diagnosed, I, I started seeing a psychiatrist and I saw her every week for a long time. And in one of the sessions, she, she asked me, you know, I was, I was complaining constantly about being completely overwhelmed and busy with life. And, and she said, well, have you ever considered doing any less, <laughs> you know, slowing down, doing less, taking the foot off the accelerator a bit? Uh, and I had, I hadn't, I, I never thought that that was an option and I was kind of offended because it was so counter to what I'd been taught success was, you know? So, um, I took this idea away from my session with my psychiatrist and I, I stewed on it for a few days until I realized that actually, yes, that is probably what I needed to do less, to slow down, to, you know, to really prioritize my life, but I had no idea how to do it. Uh, so I, I Googled, how do I simplify my life? <laughs> And that brought me to Zen Habits, Leo Babauta's blog. So Leo writes about uh, lots of things, but minimalism and decluttering was, was his main focus for a while there. And that was my first, uh, I guess, experience of, of people talking about living with less stuff. I mean, he also writes about meditation and changing your relationships and all that sort of stuff, but I couldn't in the headspace I was in at that time, I could not possibly even consider doing something like meditating. Um, but what I thought I could do was decluttering. Uh, and that's, so that's where I started. And of course, being, you know, the overachiever <laughs> that I was at the time, I thought, well, I'll just declutter everything. I'll declutter my whole house this weekend, you know, and then I'll be honest and <laughs> problem solved. Uh, but of course, it's, you know, that's not really how, how it works. Um, so I, I really had to force myself to start small, you know, I tried to declutter my entire garage one Saturday morning and that was a disaster. So I thought, well, what's the opposite of that? What's the tiniest thing I could do? And I started with my purse. And then it was a number of months of just those tiny bite-sized uh, tasks every day. You know, the glove box of the car, the, uh, you know, one of the boxes of medicines in the medicine cabinet, empty shampoo bottles, all those tiny little things that, that began to add up after about two or three months of, of consistent action. And that was when I started to think this could actually have an impact on other areas of my life as well. So what were those areas that it went on to impact? No, oh, uh, everything actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it, initially it started to impact my, um, my contentment, my level of contentment. And that's not something I expected at all. I think just having that white space, you know, that, that buffer, that visual buffer even, in my homes, you know, a, a shelf that I had decluttered gave me peace. <laughs> and that peace was something that then infiltrated uh, the way that I spoke to my kids and the way that I interacted with them. You know, I had a mental buffer and a bit of mental white space as a result of it. And that impacted the way that I, you know, Ben and I, our relationship was, was working, um, which at that time was pretty tough and tense, you know. And it was just being okay with things how they were that had a, an enormous impact. And of course, over the subsequent months and years, it has seen me do things like starting to meditate and slowing down and changing the way that I was, um, you know, living inside my life and then the way that that looked on the outside as well. So I, not everybody who listens to us listens to you. And I just wanted to let people know that you have so drastically changed your life that you've just come back from 15 months of living overseas. So um, that was, um, that's been a huge journey from going from being extremely overwhelmed and running around frantically with one and a half children and both of you working full time to 
being able to sell your house in Sydney and move overseas for 15 months. So do you want to tell us a little bit more about that journey? Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, had you told me that <laughs> eight years ago, I would not have believed you. There was no, there is no <laughs> way that that was something I had, even in my wildest dreams, uh, had envisioned. So it, that kind of all began when, my, when Ben, my husband, went from working full-time, very, very full-time, corporate job in Sydney uh, to being self-employed and that was uh, three and a half years ago uh, I think maybe four and a half years ago and that I think was for us because it was a culmination of hundreds of conversations about is this possible is this wise uh, you know what do we gain from from this and what do we lose from it you know weighing up the pros and cons but essentially once he began uh, working as a self-employed person our I think our, our, our view of, of what work was and how that fit into our family life and, you know, the benefits of that, they, it all shifted enormously. And suddenly things like working remotely for a year weren't fantastical anymore. You know, it was, it was actually a possibility. And, of course, it still took two and a half years of, of planning and, you know, hemming and hawing about it. And it wasn't until uh, I was... My book, my second book was published, picked up for publishing in the States and they wanted me to do a book tour that we decided that's about as strong a message. <laughs> you can't, can't ignore, ignore it at that point, can you? No, it's like, well, yeah, it's still scary, uh, but this is obviously where we should be facing, you know, and, uh, and that's sort of what we did. We, we book ended the book tour with, um, you know, five or six months of, of slow travel in Canada either side. So, Brooke, heaps of our listeners are on their declutter journey and they kind of feel like they're spearheading it within their family. So people say to us that they're frustrated that their family aren't, like, excitedly jumping on board. And when you started, your kids were just babies and now they're older. So what does it look like for your family as a unit to have kind of travelled this journey with you to where you are now? Yeah, it's it's such an interesting question because I think it's necessary unless you and your partner or you and your kids come at this realisation together, which is pretty uncommon. I think it's necessary for there to be someone spearheading this um, movement in your family to start with at least. Mm-hmm. And for, that was definitely the case for me. I mean, I consider myself really fortunate that I discovered the whole idea of decluttering and simplifying when my kids were babies because they had no idea what of theirs I got rid of. <laughs> And it was great. (laughs) There was no one complaining about their favorite toy disappearing. I mean, not that I would declutter their favorite toy, but (laughs) they didn't know. Um, And and as they get older, yeah, it it totally is. Uh, But as they get older, of course, they they begun they they take ownership of their space and their belongings, and that's something that I think it's really important to respect to a certain extent. uh, That you know, our kids need to be able to make those decisions for themselves and to start to formulate a sense of place in the world. So as um, the kids got older, I would do this really boring thing, um, the beginning of every school holidays, where I would work with them to tidy up and declutter their bedrooms and go through their wardrobes and, you know, take out clothes that don't fit anymore. And we do that four times a year. And what I found was the first couple of times doing that was like pulling teeth. But the kids got used to it. Uh, and they also got used to the benefits of, you know, having less stuff in their room and, and, and less stuff to keep tidy and, um, you know, not feeling overwhelmed by the amount of stuff that they had in their space. So I found that that has really helped them to develop an understanding of what enough is and that, you know, yeah, you're absolutely allowed to have a collection of sticks if you want, <laughs> as long as, you know, this is the space for which that has been identified. And if it goes beyond that, then we need to have a conversation. And I found that, uh, particularly with, with our eldest, she's very mindful of that. I mean, our youngest is mm-hmm. eight and he's a collector, uh, but it's still something that they understand, you know, it needs to be confined. So for me, I think involving the kids once they're a certain age has been really helpful and important. Uh, and I think the other side of the question is, what if you have a partner who is not on board at all? Mm. And which is also a very common question. I'm sure that you guys would would hear a lot. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I think that uh, at least initially, that shouldn't matter too much. To be honest, I think that it's really easy to um, 
lay the blame or the reason for all the clutter at someone else's feet because, you know, it's easier. It's easier to, to say, well, our house would be tidy if it wasn't for her stuff or, you know, our, I wouldn't have a problem with clutter if it wasn't for all of his stuff. And I, what I discovered when I stopped thinking that was that if I looked around and dealt with just my own stuff first, Aww. there was a lot of it. And even me removing my excess made a huge difference without touching anyone else's. Uh, so I think that's the first thing that I, I'm glad that I realised that I, could, I, I wasn't you know, hamstrung by the people I was living with. I could make changes to my own stuff initially and it did make a difference. But the thing that then happened is that Ben uh, came home one day and said, well, you know, it's Saturday tomorrow, we, we'll have to clean. And I said, no, I've, I've done it, we don't need to. I like, How? I'm like what? That's, that never happens. <laughs> I said, well, it's just we have less stuff, you know, and it's easier to clean. Um, and that was, I think, the first time he ever recognised a practical benefit to what I was doing that, that impacted our entire family. And then another, you know, another weekend I came home and found him clearing out his wardrobe. I hadn't said anything to him about it uh, because he realized that he had way more clothes than I did and he was embarrassed. So, <laughs> so that, uh, you know, I think that when you are a little more patient um, and, and gentle, I guess, with the process rather than talking at people about it all the time, what I've in, in my experience anyway, that people will begin to, to see and enjoy those benefits and then sometimes want to be a part of what you're doing. Excellent. That's so um, exactly what we talked about a couple of weeks ago in another episode of ours. Um, we talked, it's called, it's all my husband and kids fault. And we, we basically said exactly what you just said. So thank you, Brooke, for backing us up there. <laughs> 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 and it's so funny um, how you're talking about your children because last night I had I was putting Amelie to bed and she was really like stirred up about going to bed and she's like mum can you put some oils on me please just to help me calm down because I can't calm down and I was like yeah there's one in your room somewhere and I went to her bedside drawer and it was um, um I couldn't find it in there and she goes yeah I know mum I've got to declutter that tomorrow Aww. it's getting so messy isn't it <laughs> And, I, and you know, I didn't need to say anything. She was self-motivated enough to, to, uh, to see that we couldn't find what we were looking for because of her clutter. So I think it really is amazing how, uh, you know, the, the saying that, that people won't necessarily remember what you say to them, but they'll remember how you made them feel. Mm. Um, you know, like teaching by doing is far more impactful than teaching by telling. And uh, before we left for our trip, we decided to give away most of our stuff. So uh, we got a small storage unit with a couple of pieces of furniture and some of the kids' toys and clothes in it. But we gave away everything else. We had a, a garage sale uh, one weekend, but uh, everything was free. I loved that idea. It was so much fun and such a liberating experience to just see things go and it w I was really curious to see how the kids would go with that, but I think that they had kind of grown up with this idea that it's okay to let go of things seasonally. We don't need to keep things forever. Oh. There was so much stuff that they had really outgrown, but that's not always an indicator of the fact that they're going to let go of it. Uh, and they were just happy to put it on the table and see other people take it and other kids. And even while we were traveling, they said, um, they both said, when we, when we get home and we find a new house and we settle down, uh, we're going to have a garage sale and sell all of our toys because oh. they travel with a bag of Lego and a couple of that was it. And they realised how little they needed to be happy. So, Brooke, can you just talk us through this garage sale idea? Because I, I absolutely loved it when you talked about it on your podcast and I haven't had anyone that I've been able to convince to do it and we don't have enough stuff to do it ourselves. Did you find that people came and were hesitant to take things because they were free or did you find that people kind of came and just went crazy? Like what was the experience that you kind of observed? Because you weren't having to worry about money. You were able to interact with people. What was that like? It was so interesting and I actually saw both ends of that spectrum. So someone would come in and they'd, they'd have a poke around and they'd say, how much is this? So that's free. I say, I'm sorry, <laughs> that's free. <laughs> you know, everything here is free. And they'd, they'd kind of look at me oddly and then continue poking around, pick something else up or point to something. And what about, what about that? I said, that's free as well. And they said, but... Like, no, I want to give you some money for it. I said, but we don't, we don't want any money for it. We're really genuinely happy for things to go 
to other people. And so you had those people who then kind of felt bad about it. You know, we, we gave our barbecue away. It was like a big yeah. barbecue. And a guy came and I said, no, it's free. He said, let me give you some money. I said, honestly, we don't want any money. This is an experiment. Um, please take it. And the next day he had dropped, um, you know, a box of chocolates and a case of beer <laughs> off at the front. <laughs> it was too bad about taking it. And he wasn't the only one. Someone else dropped off, um, you know, chocolates and a fruit basket. And it was really interesting. But then, of course, we had the upper, opposite end of the spectrum where someone said, you know, how much is this? Everything's free. And she would have taken a boot full of stuff. Wow. I have a feeling that she was, uh, maybe she was an eBay re- reseller or something like that. I'm like, hey, go make money of it. I don't care. Um, yeah. And it was really, really interesting. Uh, to see people grapple with that because we're not used to the idea of stuff not having, not that it doesn't have value, but not have monetary value. Yeah, and not monetary value to you in the moment, but as you said, with the eBay reseller, maybe monetary value to her. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's what it is, you know, and then people are like, well, what's wrong with it? There's nothing wrong with it. We were using it up until yesterday. Uh, We just don't have space for it. We don't, you know, I'm not going to pay to store this stuff. Uh, and it's not important enough for us to do that. Anything that was, we did. Yeah, so I think that that idea of value and also, I mean, it's I don't think it's necessarily common to come across someone who is flying in the face of that. So I think that was the first experience I'd ever had with someone saying, actually, this stuff does not matter to me at all. It's not important, um, you know, and to the world with it. So, yeah, it was a very, very interesting experience. Maybe you could have um, come up with some kind of a trade system. If you subscribe to my podcast, you can take whatever you want for free. <laughs> That's the way my evil brain works. <laughs> you need an entrepreneur you know, like Amy. Take bigger, bigger things that you're like, five-star review end over here. That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, see, see the person I get, I have the absolute pleasure of being in business with. <laughs> She's got creative entrepreneurial ideas coming out of every pore of her. (laughs) Let's take a break for a bit of a real talk about home printers. Printers can be a massive headache. Like if you haven't got it set up right and you can't print off the right devices, it's so annoying. But they don't have to be. In a perfect world, printers are easy to set up. You can print from your phone. There's always someone to help you and you never make a typo. Well, Canon are making that perfect world a reality, except of course for that last bit. Setup is a breeze with Print Assist step-by-step video guides. You just follow the prompts and get yourself running. They'll even show you how to connect your wireless printer to a computer or smart device, which is the best when the kids need to print something and don't need to first put it on your computer. And if you need help, there's a chat bot available 24-7, or you can call up during the day and get talked through the process step-by-step. Print easily, wirelessly, and smoothly with Canon. Visit canon.com.au forward slash print to discover all the ways Canon can support you. It's wonderful. Are you loving getting into decluttering and organising? Are you excited to get into different spaces in your house and to see the transformation that is possible? But are you also finding that there are some things that just aren't sticking, that you're finding that you just don't have the routine or system to really hold you where you want to be? Well, Kirsty and I have developed the Art of Decluttering online course, which is an amazing six-module self-paced course with an interactive Facebook community. So if you want to go from overwhelmed to just nailing this decluttering thing, we would love you to join us. You just visit artofdecluttering.com.au forward slash course. We have payment plans available. Access it today and see that transformation that you've been dreaming of. Have an organised home that stays organised for life. We cannot wait to see you in the course. Um, So some of our listeners are just starting out on their decluttering journey and haven't yet explored minimalism and slow living. Um, So we just want to ask you, in your opinion, what was the benefits of living slower and a less stressed life? And and let me count thy ways, Brooke. Yeah. I think uh, the benefits have been um, way beyond anything that I have ever expected. And it was interesting. I definitely started out simply with this idea of decluttering and kind of tagged it onto minimalism because this, this whole idea of doing less and having less 
and living more, which is sort of what I think minimalism at its core is, was so appealing to me because I, I truly felt at that time that I discovered it in my life that I wasn't living, I was just existing. And, uh, you know, anyone who's gone through a big transition, doesn't matter what it is, but it's some kind of self-realisation and shift and improvement and, and um, you know, uh, that, that evolution will tell you that it's really painful to go through that. It's not easy and it's not, ironically, it's not even simple to do it. You know, simple living is ironically kind of complex when you first discover it. Uh, and it's about figuring out what is important to you as an individual, you know, what your highest priorities in life are, what, um, you know, what, what your values are. And, and I didn't know what any of those things were. I mean, I thought I did. And, and had you asked me what are your highest priorities in life eight years ago, I would have said, well, my family, you know, and, and, and loving my family and, and, and kind of that was it. And then I would look at how I was spending my time and my energy and it wasn't in service of that value at all. Mm. I was living kind of counter to that. And I think that's for me where that huge disconnect was between, um, you know, the life that I was living and the life that I thought that I was trying to live and I actually wasn't. So the biggest, for me, the first huge benefit was doing that work of, and this kind of came throughout the process, the process of decluttering. Uh, it was doing that work of figuring out what actually is important to me. And I wrote my own eulogy uh, five years ago. And that was uh, probably the first, aside from dis discovering the whole minimalism thing, that was probably the first big turning point for me because it gave me permission to start making decisions based on those things that, I, that made it into my eulogy, you know, the eulogy-worthy stuff. And once I had that there, I was able to start making choices about, um, you know, where my, my energy and time and the space in my life should, should go and where it shouldn't. And that made it a lot simpler, not easier, but simpler to do it. Uh, and as a result, I think everything began to change after that. You know, I, I found it, uh, again, not necessarily easier, but, but simpler to say no to things and to say yes to things and to let go of things that weren't in service of that. So, you know, when people ask me about what's, what are the benefits of slow living, sometimes I think they're expecting a, a list of practical answers, you know. But for me, it's, oh. there's no way of summing up what slow living necessarily is because it's different for everyone. It's about figuring out what is your why, what is your most important eulogy-worthy values in life, and then creating a life that allows you to spend more time with those things by letting go of the stuff that isn't those things. Um, and I think that realisation is honestly the thing that's going to, to continue on, no matter how my, my vision of slow changes over the years. Like that, that's the thing that will, I will carry on through the rest of my life. I really love that, Brooke. And I think, um, you know, we see you as someone who was, what's the word, when a trailblazer, that's the word I'm looking for, a trailblazer in the simplicity movement in Australia and the world and certainly have been an inspiration for both Kirst and I. The vision we have for the art of decluttering is to transform the world through intentional living. And I'm guessing that when you started out, there wasn't a whole lot of people, you, you were forging alone. What, how's the landscape changed in the last, say, five years where people are starting to jump on board or ascribe to this minimalist movement? It has changed so much. Um, it was a real outlier movement before. I mean, the, the boys from The Minimalists brought out their documentary, I don't know, I'm going to say maybe three years ago. Uh, and I think that was a, like a lightning rod for a lot of people who had never heard of this movement mm -hmm. before to start questioning just what the heck are we doing with our lives? You know, what, like, is, is the accruement of material possessions what I want my life to be? And no one would say yes to that. But yet we all, to some extent, have lived like that. So I think that was a huge movement and a moment for the movement. And it's been really interesting, though, to see how it has shifted. And I think the, the minimalism movement particularly has been not particularly well served by social media. I mean, it has to a certain extent, but hashtag minimalism has moved so far away from what I think true minimalism is. Uh, and that's because it's been kind of co-opted or, or 
confused with minimalism aesthetic as opposed to minimalism as a lifestyle. And they're not necessarily one and the same because if you're just getting rid of all of your stuff to buy nice, like nicer, newer, whiter mm-hmm. stuff, then that's not necessarily going to get you where the original version of minimalism wanted to get you, which was to live like you guys are helping people to do, live more intentionally. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, to see this, this <laughs> really uh, big shift in the, the minimalism conversation to where people are trying to sell stuff to minimalists, I find it really interesting to watch because obviously there's power in that movement and marketers and product creators are trying to tap into that market. Um, and slow living, I think, is, is kind of similar. And I realized it when I was writing my book that people we're expecting a book about slow living to be about one particular version of slow living, you know, whether it's moving to the country and baking your own bread and wearing all natural fiber clothes and, uh, you know, having a, a really muted, pretty Instagram feed and all that sort of stuff. Like that can be slow living, but that's a, like one person's version of it. And if it's uh-huh. them, then, then wonderful, but uh, it's not true and genuine for everyone. And I, again, I find um, myself, I don't know, really curious about how that's going to to evolve. I'm, I mean, I'm not I'm not against any of it. Like it's whatever works for individual people. But again, I think I talk to so many people who are they love the idea of slow living, but then they start exploring it and they think that it needs to look a certain way in order to be doing it properly. And I just don't think that that's true at all. Mm-hmm. You can, you can live slow in the city. You can live slow while you're working 60 hours a week. You can live slow if you've got five kids and, uh, you know, you're a stay-at-home parent. You can live slow living in the suburbs or the country. Like, it, it's not contingent on what your life looks like from the outside. It's about how you live with intention within it. Uh, and that's what I hope to keep the conversation about slow living surrounding. You know, it doesn't need to look a particular way. It needs to to serve you. Perfect. That's exactly why Amy and I are passionate about it and we um, live differently to each other um, on in some ways, it's a really similar. Um, we're, we're both professional organisers. We've both got two kids. We've both got partners. Um, but the way we go about our intentional living is different. Um, and we really um, love love everything that you're putting out into this world. I know here's, here's my another fangirling moment. Um, but that is one of the reasons I absolutely adore your podcast because I love – the breadth and the depth and the width and the height of the people that you interview because you they just showcase so beautifully that slow and intentional living is so multifaceted and it doesn't have to look one way and there's no right way of doing it like I love I love 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 your um, idea of eulogy and living towards those values that you want espoused at the end of your life um, and working your way, however that is, whether it's slow or fast way of getting there, you know, whether it takes you five years to get um, to go traveling around the world with your family or you that's you know never your intention and you never get there, um, that you are just being intentional and that like Amy and I are really passionate about being intentional in in and we're, you know, we're a work in progress as well. And we're trying our hardest to be intentional in everything that we do um, from what we, you know, what chocolate we buy at the supermarket um, all the way through to how we spend our time and our dreams and our hopes for the world. So um, we just really want to thank you for being a trailblazer in Australia and around the world. Um, and for me personally, I remember reading your blogs when I had you know, when you were on this journey, when you started this journey, because um, I remember being at home with my two little kids who are the same age as yours and reading your journey and being inspired. So um, thank you, thank you, thank you. We wanted to ask you um, what you're passionate about now and where you are in your journey and what gets you fired up and what are you wanting to advocate for at this point in 2019? Such a good question. Uh, and for me, slow living has probably always been attached particularly the last six or seven years to the idea of how we live on the planet you know the impact that we have on the environment and over the last few years I've just been drawn to and feel this calling to focus even more of my not even necessarily my 
podcasting work or my writing work, but my living uh, in to how we can start to shift the tide of damage to the environment and pollution and plastics and you know, climate, the climate crisis and all of it. It's, that's where my passion lies and it's a funny place to have passion because it's also a very testing place to start to explore you know, um, in the current political climate and the fact that we're still having conversations about whether climate change is... Oh. <laughs> You know, it's, it's, so it's, it's, don't really- get us started, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you should see Amy, she's fist pumping. You're talking about climate change and she's like literally fist pumping and it's like, if she could have yelled, she would have. <laughs> so for me, like, I can't, I can't actually, I, I can't separate slow living in the way that I'm choosing to live from living sustainably anymore. There's no way to do that. And for me, it's just figuring out how I want, uh, whether I want that to cross over into the work that I'm doing or whether I want that to be something else that I start. I don't know. But all I know is that I'm, you know, I'm trying to raise my kids with an awareness that what we do on the planet matters and how we live matters. And also trying to start to, I guess I feel like I'm kind of, not right at the beginning of a new journey, but, um, you know, unpacking and unpicking what I want that, what I, what I think that should look like in terms of practical changes. You know, where do I start? How do I start to encourage my kids to make those changes with me? How do I make a bigger shift? So the environment and um, global impact and your sustainable decisions are really kind of forefront for you guys at the moment. Is that right? We've just yep. done a calculation of the carbon footprint of our trip from last year. Um, which is phenomenally huge. Um, we took like a number of flights, drove 25,000 kilometres uh, on the book tour alone. And that was something that I, I felt, uh, you know, I think I felt hypocritical about talking about the environment if I wasn't going to face up to my own personal impact. Uh, so now I'm in the middle of talking to two different organisations who plant tree to offset our annual carbon um, footprint and there's one in Australia that I think I work with and there's an international one um, for me I think that's sort of the beginning of what I sense will be a huge shift in the way that we live so it's not only talking about it, it's not only raising awareness and advocating it's how do I change the way me and my family live and operate in this world um, mm. In, I think. And I think too, what your trip was, was an investment. It's not like you were going over there and just having a holiday. You were actually inspiring, teaching, giving tools to others to live more simply. So even though your carbon footprint might have, you know, made your eyes bulge, the flow on effect of your influence is actually a reduced carbon footprint. I mean, I hope so. That's a really like a, a nice way of looking at it. And I think that that's possibly true and I, I mean I certainly know from all the events that we did that it, and, and the feedback since that people have begun to shift the way they're living and that's incredible that's all I could ever possibly even hope to ask for from a trip like that um, but I also think that it's important to take ownership and be responsible for our own choices because otherwise you know I, I can't really point the finger um, at anyone else who's, who's living less uh, intentionally in terms of the environment than me. Do you know what we totally forgot to tell you when we started the podcast today? This is our 100th episode that we're recording with you. You're like our special amazing guest for our 100th episode. Congratulations. Congratulations. Oh God. <laughs> Thanks. I yeah, can't so think of anyone we'd prefer to have on to celebrate with us. Well, I can't think of anywhere I'd prefer to be. Oh, Brooke, we could literally sit here and talk for hours and on that note, we will be having you back next week to talk about Woo-hoo. some more questions that we've had from listeners. So this week was all about Amy and I and our questions and not even all of them. Just this, you know, <laughs> this is me being very, very controlled. Um, but next week we're going to get you back and we're going to um, talk to you about all the, some questions that our listeners have had. So we're super excited. So we're, But we are so thankful that you came on today. We really, really appreciate your time and we really love everything that you're putting out into the world and we will continue to be some of your biggest raving fans. So thank you. No, thank you. Ladies. I've enjoyed this so much. It's been like a, a genuine pleasure to chat with you. 
And I think everyone needs to jump on their Insta feed. And Brooke, am I right that it's Slow Home Pod that they need to look for in Insta? Yes. Excellent. Yeah, that's Excellent. the podcast one. But even more than that, you all have to start listening to the podcast. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if you don't already, which we know lots of you do, if you don't already, um, get on, listen to it, and your life will be so much more multifaceted, coloured, beautiful because of it. So to finish today's episode, I'm going to read out a review from iTunes from Kay Milha, um, five-star review titled favorite podcast. This podcast is the best. Not only do Kirsty and Amy give you practical advice, they also give you the mindset principles which underlie them with such grace and kindness to their listeners. I recommend the podcast to all my friends and I love listening each week. So thank you for leaving that podcast review. You guys know that we love them. You fill our love tanks when we get to read the reviews. So thank you. Thank you again, Brooke, and um, make sure that you tune in again next week because you get some more Brooke goodness. Yay. See ya. Bye. Thanks for joining us. If you've learned something awesome today, we'd love you to leave us a review on iTunes or Facebook so others can find our podcast too. Don't forget you can see the show notes in your podcast app or over at our website, artofdecluttering.com.au. So if there's anything you want more info on, check it out there. If you'd like to join our supporter community, you can do so over at patreon.com slash decluttering. We hope you have a great rest of your day and enjoy the freedom. 